Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Game Changer. I'm Maryam Zia. Pakistan, like many other countries, has been facing economic challenges that require our immediate attention. In today's program, we will be discussing economic challenges of Pakistan. Of course, we know that we are facing uh, multifaceted uh, problems that includes inflation as well as uh, fiscal deficits. Uh, what steps are needed uh, to address these challenges we will be exploring in today's program. To discuss this and more, I'm joined in the studios by Mr. Hamza Rifat, who is senior analyst. Welcome to the program. Thank you. We're also joined by former president ICCI, Mr. Tosif Zaman. Welcome to the program. We are joined online by Dr. Hassan Javed, who is economist and se senior analyst. Welcome to the program. And we're also joined by former advisor finance, Dr. Hakan Najib. Welcome to the program. Um, Mr. Uh, Tosif Zaman, let me start with you. When we talk about the current economic uh, situation of Pakistan, how do you view the internal challenges that are, we are facing today that had led to the current economic situation of the country? Well, if we look a uh, year back, our textile sector, which was the backbone of the economy, that was in full swing. About uh, 1,600 billion rupee of imports were on the way for machinery to have more infrastructure. Our all textile sector was extremely busy and it was hard to find a job. We recovered very well from uh, COVID. So uh, Mr. Hamza, um, how do you view the current economic situation? Of course, uh, what are primary uh, causes when we talk about uh, internal challenges as well as, as uh, the external ch challenges that had led to uh, the current economic environment that uh, we are witnessing today? Well, Mariam, I think the government inherited an economy which was facing a multitude of different challenges, both internally and externally. Externally, we've had the Russia-Ukraine war and the impact on supply-side shocks, which has really had an impact on Pakistan. Its ability to generate revenue has been severely compromised because the previous government has not been able to finalize an IMF deal. Um, but at the very same time, I think prudent policies have been undertaken by this current government to try and make sure that they can redress many of the external and internal challenges. One of the uh, very good examples of that is to try and increase revenue uh, collection. When we talk about FBR, revenue is actually coming in. If you take a look at the tax collection or the statistics as far as tax collection is concerned, that has increased exponentially. The current account deficit has reduced to 3.1 billion at this point in time. And if you go a straight, uh, if you uh, you know com compare it with the previous year, it was 13.1 billion. So that means the government has tried to improve reforms as far as revenue generation is concerned. But Pakistan, given the fact that it uh, you know its exports are being heavily 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 impacted by you know exogenous factors for example the Ukraine war really needs to try and make sure that they can navigate through these difficult realities we've had neighboring Sri Lanka for example in the region which mm. has just witnessed bankruptcy of and one course. of the reasons why was because of poor uh, government policies from the Rajapaksa regime. This government, on the other hand, is trying to make uh, sure that you know Pakistan does not go on to the verge of default and for that prudent measures are actually being implemented. But to expect, uh, you could say, um, instant results would be a bit of a far-fetched thought. Of we course. still need to give government this government continuity as far as policies of are course. concerned. Of course. We will be exploring uh, these options and what steps are needed to revitalize the economy. Uh, uh, Mr. Khakan, uh, uh, Dr. Khakan, when we talk about uh, global economic trends, how do you view that the current fluctuations in the global environment have impacted uh, Pakistan's economy in the recent years? Mariam, certainly there has been an impact of the global slowdown, uh, the rising interest rates in the world, um, and also a, a kind of a turmoil in the financial um, sectors, which came because the rates went that high. The excess of the emerging markets, and Pakistan being an emerging markets, has thus slowed to the monies that we needed. So I think um, that, and the export has also been um, affected on the other side um, because Pakistan's exports to EU and US um, with them slowing down um, have partly been affected. And thirdly, our imports became more expensive because of the commodity super cycle due to which last year's current account went very high. And then we tried to enact policies to bring the current account down by slowing down the imports um, to a large extent. Um, so that's been the global picture. Uh, but the domestic picture has been as tough, Maria, um, right. as we uh, um, 
you know, or you can talk about it later. Um, you know, we couldn't get into the IMF program for the last 18, let's talk 20 about months. This, uh, right. Let's talk about the uh, internal challenges uh, that had led to this uh, economic situation. Uh, uh, Dr. Khakan, uh, what in your view were the primary reasons, uh, specifically when we talk about the internal challenges of the country? So, Mariam, I have always said that Pakistan was a very lucky country because we were in an IMF program as we came out of COVID. Um, the um, countries like Sri Lanka, Ghana, Bangladesh had to go and look at to a new program. So it took them a while and it hurt them. Pakistan came out of COVID well. We were in an IMF program, but then onwards there, the management of the IMF program has been on the weaker side, where whether it was the petrol subsidy, then the um, budget that we gave, not um, the FY22, but even the FY21 budget was expansionary. So the IMF and Pakistan started having a distant relationship rather than a close relationship where they could help Pakistan. I think that continued, but in the current regime in August, they were able to complete the seventh and the eighth review, and there was good stabilization, macroeconomic stabilization that was happening. But right. since but, then, of course, but we still witness, uh, Dr. Khakan, that uh, uh, IMF program has remained crucial for Pakistan's economy. What do you uh, think that some of the sticking points that it led to the current situation and how to move forward uh, in the backdrop of or in the context of IMF program, specifically when we talk about the negotiations going on? So, Mariam, you've said three very, very important things. One, this is one of the most crucial aspects of managing Pakistan's economy to stick with the IMF and use it as an anchor not to default and have enough dollars coming into the country in the short run. Now, the sticking, so we've agreed on one thing. The uh, uh, sticking points have been that Pakistan, as I said, gave a, for example, in February, March, a petrol subsidy didn't go well with the IMF. Um, the earlier budget probably didn't go well with the IMF. Then uh, we did try to hold the rupee uh, somewhere um, um, uh, at certain levels. Um, that didn't go well. Gas prices didn't get increased for 30 months. That didn't go well. So then the government came in and took the hard steps. 170 billion rupees of taxation, gas price change, um, electricity price change, and also some easing of the um, uh, rupee, where rupee was able to uh, move um, um, according to market conditions. Today, when you ask that question, so that's your second part. The third part that you ask, how do we go forward? Nathan Porter, and, and I give credit to the um, Prime Minister, um, um, Shahbaz Sharif, that he made a call to the IMF MD. Now, that sends one signal. The government is committed to do a program to complete the staff level agreement if it is possible for them to do so. So that's a good sign to the market. Any responsible economic or country manager should be thinking like that, and that's a good call to make. Right, that that is a good step. But uh, Dr. Sen uh, Jawed, when we uh, see the these agreement uh, or negotiations going on, talks going on with uh, IMF, uh, the delay in reaching an agreement or a deal has, uh, you know, led to uh, the current uh, uncertainty in investors as well. How do you view the current political uh, economic situation, keeping in mind the political uh, situation of the country as well? Right, as uh, Dr. Khakan said, that it is a global phenomena which, uh, of course, affect the Pakistan's IMF negotiation even. So, uh, I mean, if you think that uh, I am indirectly pointing out the IMF negotiation, so if you see them, uh, the first uh, one must assert uh, as uh, who is really at the fault for the continued the pending, uh, uh, pendency of the IMF ninth review. So pendency since November 22 as per the 7th and 8th review documents. So is it uh, the IMFS consultancy to, or it is a refusal for uh, by our economy, economic team leader to accept the ground realities to erroneously elevate the uh, navally organ the uh, data the government shares with the fund in uh, 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 other areas. So a series of the a uh, series of the policies and statements, their uh, timing and uh, abundant 
since uh, uh, 27 september 22 uh, when the uh, mr dar took oath as a country finance minister uh, would allow one to draw one's own conclusion so a very important thing is that it, the, the review uh, is continuously delayed and then imf team left pakistan on 9th november and then uh, 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 the, the uh, uh, Mr. Dar held a press conference the next day after the ministry uh, repeatedly alerted the media that uh, he would do so. So on 10th uh, January, the, uh, Mr. Dar declared the Memorandum of Economic and Financial Policies, MEFP, and have been received the instant and talk ended on a positive note, while the uh, funds press release and noted uh, clearly that it would not seek a broad date of the approval of the ninth review and subsequent and disrupt the next uh, trance. So the uh, standard uh, procedure for the fund is to upload the MEFP on the website as when the staff level agreement is reached, which uh, when it remains uh, pending. So why it is continuously pending, it is a very much important issue. And of course, uh, we must have to understand that there is an international uh, uh, I mean, uh, resistance to us that IMF is not uh, right. releasing everything. Right. Anything. That's uh, that's what I want to have, talk about, Doctor Hasan. That what are some of the geopolitical topic. pressures uh, that had led to delay in this uh, IMF uh, deal that we are talking about, and how can Pakistan effectively navigate uh, these pressures? See, there are so many uh, other international issues. I mean. Um, if, if people don't think so, but uh, 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 it is my personal opinion uh, and uh, uh, nothing to do with the PTB word or any other uh, institution. Uh, it, uh, Iran and Saudis deal, we are dealing, uh, we are in the deal with the, uh, I mean, we are not consolidating the issue of IPPs. We are not consolidating the other issues. We are not consolidating the state-owned enterprises. We are not consolidating the other challenges which we have, but we are... Uh, dealing in the electricity project as an alternative project, which is 74, uh, 74 megawatt uh, deal with Iran, and most probably it would be the 300 megawatt deal with the Iran. Then when we have the CPAC, and then we have the transit program with the 70 kilometer of the uh, 70 kilometer from uh, uh, Gawadar to Chabahar, and then the uh, 59 uh, uh, billion dollar more trans coming to uh, CPAC. So. Uh, uh, and then is a rollover. 2.3 uh, uh, billion of the rollover is coming from the uh, China and rollover been given by China. So this is an international Saudi thing. Saudi has also announced its uh, current support to the program. Uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, uh, again, please. Saudi Arabia has also um, announced financial uh, assistance to uh, address the current economic uh, challenges that the Pakistan is facing. Yes, initially, uh, I mean, initially we were thinking about that. Why, uh, why, why they are hesitating to, uh, I mean, uh, giving us the 1.1 billion of the tranche, which was with the pending since the staff level as, and the extended fund facility was about to have the 7 billion of the dollar, as uh, Dr. Khakan mentioned that. But they are reluctant continuously, and they have affected us. And one of the most important reason I would uh, mention the name of the Asad Umar, he. Uh, persistently uh, negate the idea of the IMF. He delayed the project, uh, I mean, uh, IMF uh, program for the eight months and then he delayed continuously. Yes, previous government uh, 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 negotiated with the IMF in a bad way, but uh, meanwhile, they must have to have the uh, relationship in oil uh, from the Russia, Iran, Saudi, and the UAE. So after that, uh, the IMF tries. They said that, that you have to complete the 25 sanctions and uh, 25 right. uh, cordons of course, to of complete course, the Pakistan deal. Of course, Pakistan has been implementing the prerequisites. Uh, Mr. Hamza, uh, when we talk about uh, these uh, developments that have been ongoing for a few months now, uh, and the recent development is that uh, last week, uh, American Ambassador Mr. Donald Bloom also met uh, uh, Finance Minister uh, Ishaq Dar, and he promised that uh, U.S. is going to help uh, Pakistan uh, to get uh, an early uh, uh, release of IMF deal. So how do you view this uh, situation or these developments, Pakistan's relations with US and the current uh, economic challenges that Pakistan is facing? 
Well, historically, America has always provided aid to Pakistan. Mm. It's always been there as far as relief is concerned. I think uh, in the popular press, China and Saudi Arabia and a few of the other friendly countries normally um, you know, make uh, headlines for that matter. But I think America is an extremely important partner as far as Pakistan is concerned in providing economic relief is concerned and at the very same time to try and make sure that they can invest in sectors for example Pakistan's domestic industrial capacity mm. which includes uh, you know uh, textile exports we're talking about steel manufacturing we're talking about exports of uh, you know rice and so many other different products that uh, have an, a key impact on the current account deficit for that matter so I think uh, uh, US ambassador uh, Donald Bloom's uh, meeting with finance minister Sagdar comes at a very important time for Pakistan because it clearly shows that we are very extremely close to ensuring that you know the IMF review actually does materialize we're talking about the end of June so this meeting would ensure that America as a major player in the region as well and in terms of Pakistan's ec historical economic partnership can use its leverage to try and make sure that the release of funds come quickly and swiftly because we need to understand that a stable economically prosperous Pakistan is in the interest of the United States as well mm. it's not only in the interest of China or Saudi Arabia it's also in the interest of the United States as well so I think this comes at a very opportune time particularly as the current account deficit decreases significantly right so um, um, mr. Uh, Tosif when we talk about these developments how do you see the role of international financial institutions like IMF and World Bank play in uh, current economic challenges that Pakistan is facing? I think uh, if you look historically, come up uh, with the numbers, I don't know why we are so much centric of borrowing from international institutions. Mm. Right? The fact is, if you look at the mix of Pakistani budget, the funds are coming, number one source is overseas Pakistanis. Number two is our exports. Number three, this is the private sector which generates funds. So private sector does not need IMF. Overseas Pakistanis does not need IMF. Our export does not need IMF. Why we are unable to focus where the revenue lies, mm -hmm. where historically the money is coming to our accounts. We are not focusing it on that. We are not facilitating them at all. Mm -hmm. you know, so what needs to be done to, what uh, is important? to yes. diversify these export markets as well? Because uh, Pakistan's economy is limited to few sectors. So what steps are needed? What, what is important? If overseas Pakistanis are trusting us, we should trust them back. Mm -hmm. you know, whatever they are mean, if we can negotiate uh, staff level contract for many, many months with the IMF, why can't we negotiate uh, terms with overseas Pakistanis to facilitate them more, to encourage them more from Russian digital and move forward, even facilitate more to have their cover in Pakistan? Why can't we facilitate, you know, uh, our more than 95% investments are domestic investments. Why can't we facilitate our businessmen, our community, you know, to, to ease them, give them the, you know, ease of doing business. No. So what we, with, I am failed to understand with the, the government economists, you know, where the revenue is, they are not focusing on it. You know, where the money is, where the dollar is lying, they are not, they are not fo focusing on it. They are negotiating at the right doors which is not required. You know, why we are not focusing to resolve our textile sectors issue? Why we are not fo focusing on the, our IT exports? It was booming like anything. Uh, we covered about five, we are targeting five billion dollars. Why we cannot facilitate, give them more incentives to have more exports for Pakistan, to give our person who's sitting in the remote village area hmm. and exporting. So what to steps are needed to counter these or address these challenges? I beg your pardon? What steps are needed by the government to address these challenges that to, you are pointing to, out? To talk to business community, to talk to the, uh, to support the uh, demands of IT sector, uh, to have, uh, as uh, uh, Doc Sub said, we should focus on the, our relationship within the region. That is the key to everything, you know. Again, uh, what I feel from private sector, that uh, we are, you, you know, we are pushed toward IMF and the uh, US to back down, sit down with them, and turn on, negotiate on their terms, which is not required. Why but, can't we negotiate that within is, the region? That is something debatable. That is your point of view that IMF was not required. But uh, many economists are saying that the situation we are in is you're, because you're, of you're going. You are very right. You are very right. You know, but economists don't run the economy. These are the businessmen who run the economy. We are not talking to the businessmen who are the who are the practitioners. You know. Coming up with the Adam Smith philosophy does not solve Pakistan problem and we have seen over the years and over the decades it did not happen. 
you know, fiscal economy is nothing to do with Pakistan, right. but the people sitting in the business community, the right. people of, of Pakistan, course, point they taken, point need taken, to be addressed point and they taken, need to be Hamza, answered. Uh, what do you want to add in? Uh, well, uh, I completely agree with him. You know, the backbone of any economy is the private sector. When we mm. talk about the laissez fair model of mm. economics, and if you take a look at some of the most prosperous countries in the world, the government only has a small regulatory role to actually play to try and promote the uh, private business community. When you talk about reaching out to the diaspora, we're talking about reaching out to the Pakistani American businessmen who can actually ensure that dollars are actually coming into the economy. That would, uh, you know, create that needed capital and the revenue to try and resuscitate the economy rather than, you know, just banking on the IMF to bail us out. Mm -hmm. Because if without a striving, uh, without a thriving private sector, it's very difficult for the domestic economy to become export oriented. Mm -hmm. If the private sector fails in any different economy, we have different examples all across the world. Argentina, they tried to get into an IMF agreement. It, it didn't actually prosper for them. They were locked into it for about at least uh, 20 to 30 years. They couldn't, uh, you know, generate domestic capital. What did they do? That they ensured that Argentina could open up to foreign direct investment. And they also reached out to the Argentinian community abroad as well to try and generate revenue. That's exactly what Pakistan needs. I just wanted to add that, you know, I agree with this point that that's, that's the strategy that needs to be adopted. Right. That's the strategy that needs to be uh, adopted. But uh, Dr. Stan, when we talk about changing global uh, trade dynamics, how do you view that they have impacted Pakistan's, uh, uh, you know, exports uh, policy as well as the trade balance that uh, these guests are mentioning? See, uh, first of all, the, uh, if we uh, see on the Pakistan has cut the GDP growth estimated by the fiscal year 2022 and 2023 uh, to uh, is uh, 0.29. You must have to, I mean, uh, this is a red light for you people, uh, for the whole country. And from earlier estimate of the 2%, the National Account Committee, agriculture growth is 1.55%, and industri industrial growth is at minus 2.94%, and service sector growth is 0.86%, and IMF says economy will grow just by 0.5%, which is and now, for uh, by my side, uh, it is 0.29, and uh, of course, Dr. Khakan will endorse that. So o only on the fifth time, uh, time country has seen economic growth under 1%, and ADB uh, forecast backs and growth to rise on the 2%. So there are so many other things. So other projections, the fiscal deficit is projected to narrow slightly to equivalent to 6.9%, and then into as the net importer of the oil and gas backs and will continue experiencing strong inflationary pressure from the rest of 2023 and the current account balance is projected negative 2.3% in 2023. Uh, uh, um, our, uh, one of the fellows says that uh, industrial, uh, why we are not focusing on the uh, on textile industry and others either. Yes, it was on the 5.5 when it was given the subsidy. They need the industrial people, need the, the industry people and the people are in the industry, they need subsidies. They want uh, electricity on the five and other people, the, uh, the normal class people and the small and medium enterprises, they are on the 18 and 22, uh, 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 22 per unit. So this is highly, uh, uh, I mean, a demarcation. I mean, you can see that the, what, uh, what a precedent you are setting in. Why you, are, why you need the subsidies, why you need uh, industrial subsidies, you are not making any coal project, we, you are not making any energy project, you are not running your industry on the uh, 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 renewable energy, then we are uh, focusing on other sectors. But important thing is, yes, uh, we, we are working with the China and the Saudi Arabia supported by the Pakistan and help reduce the challenges faced by the uh, nose diving economy when IMF imposed a condition for the releasing right. the tranche of the $1 billion. So China has lent Pakistan more than two US dollars to prop up in the collapsing economy. So Chinese loan keeping flowing into Pakistan, although not all of the infrastructure project and all of the receiving nearly 22 billion in the short term loans from the China between 2018 and the last summer, most of the balance of the payment relief. This shows China is willing to try to ease Pakistan economic stress. But last June, China authorized a new 2.3 billion loans in discount the uh, interest rate. But Pakistan is not working on their SO, uh, state-owned enterprise. Pakistan is not pulling up. Uh, you can ask this question to uh, Dr. Khakan Najib that uh, uh, there is two, uh, two, one, two, 212 state-owned enterprises, which, which is a big pressure on our uh, uh, economy. Then is our uh, the the, the state-owned enterprises. Then is the pension. Then is the salary. 
and uh, we are not giving any ease right. to the business to the right. small so and medium let me take the enterprise same point and the commercial to, uh, prices. Dr. Khakan as well. Dr. Khakan, uh, uh, there are a number of points that are highlighted by uh, Dr. Hasnan Jawed. Uh, so, what's your take on that? And also, Pakistan is uh, relying on import of energy as well. So, uh, how do the uh, international or global fluctuation in oil prices impact the economy of Pakistan? So, Mariam, a number of important points have been raised by all participants. Um, so, let me comment on this. One, no economist in Pakistan thinks IMF is a panacea to solve Pakistan's fundamental issues. Please try and understand, there is an international architecture which says the following. If you have a balance of payments crisis, if you have a liquidity dollar crisis, Pakistan has both. Then you go to the IMF, in the short run, they will bail you out with some pricing changes, with some energy pricing, with uh, their, the currency pricing and a few taxation, and then ask you to do the fundamental things that you must do. We confuse this point and think that somehow IMF is going to structurally or fundamentally change Pakistan. That is not their job, neither are they trained to do it, and if they tell you how to do it, you will, you know, make a larger hue and cry. The other thing is people think that borrowing from overseas, from uh, Russian digital or other is cheap. You are borrowing from them at 7% in dollar terms today. The project loan, which is of 25 years with the World Bank is at 2 to 2.5%. So please try and understand how this actually works. Number three, None of the multilateral agencies stop the private sector of Pakistan or the public sector of Pakistan to get their house in order. Um, right. If you want to do expenditure reforms, please, the private sector should sit with the government and right. ask them that the pension reform, the subsidy reform, the development reform, they should show it up in the budget. Is anyone going to tell them that this is wrong? No, everyone would right, say. Of course, very that is very important, and revenue generation is also very important. So, uh, how do you view the steps that government has taken to broaden the tax base and increase uh, tax revenues in Pakistan? If we talk about uh, this recent year, Mariam, to be honest, I think every government has found it hard to tax even when they had the will. So I've sat on the table on the Q block side on the finance ministry along with the finance minister. Whenever we've gone to, you know, um, um, do the sectors which are out of the tax net or are not paying enough in the tax net, we have had to face tremendous um, uh, resistance. But, 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 uh, but what steps are needed to uh, avoid this tax evasion? Right. So first of all, let me say what the government needs to do. The government needs to make its system more efficient. If you talk about the textile, we need to give them refunds very quickly. Um, when you talk about the whole architecture, you need to get rid of the withholding taxes. You should not make them tax agents. You need to make the taxation easier. You need to reduce corporate income tax. You need to, you know, if, on the government side, you need to do all those things. Um, but then you need to also take some steps. Uh, agriculture income tax collection is paltry in the country. Um, there are 20, you know, 2.2 million retailers, 30 of 30,000 of them are paying personal income tax. You, you know, you need to start thinking that real estate of Pakistan has been incentivized and that is why all the money in trillions of rupees is parked in the real estate of Pakistan we, after five years, do away with the capital gains tax on real estate. Know your customer. The KYC in the real estate is almost non-existent. You go and open a bank account and you go and buy a plot worth millions of rupees and you right. will understand right. how difficult it is to open a bank account. So, right. you know, you have to move on these things. And lastly, of course, realize that at 8.7% of GDP, that is your tax to GDP ratio. You will keep borrowing, whether it's the IMF, the World Bank, the, um, you know, you are borrowing from the overseas also when you put them um, in the savings. You will keep borrowing. So please, all these sectors that I've said, they should come up and say that this is the tax that is due to us. 
Uh, I mean, uh, uh, trickle down effect in just one day. But in response to crisis, tremendous throughout the research are required to formulate a, a reform oriented budget, one which uh, does not burden the common folk and address the inflationary pressure by undertaking the fiscal correction. Then is the reform must uh, focus on reducing unnecessary expenditure on devote, uh, devolved uh, subject to the center moving away from the state. Uh, guaranteed pensions and involving the quantity of the country development and spending. And second, if you are focusing on the point which is very much important, this uh, uh, the black economy or what you can call is the, uh, I, I, I always say it's a shadow economy, it's a casino economy and we are uh, more, uh, our, our, our nation is mostly, uh, uh, I mean, participating in the uh, real estate and uh, w w w which is to me is a casino economy. So of course, I mean, uh, in, in a shorter time, uh, uh, Dr. Khakan uh, reply on that. But first, domestic foreign debt uh, reprofiling can help lengthen maturities with no change in the principal or interest payment. Then, is a two implementation of the Treasury single account can help the uh, appropriate scrutinizing the accounting of the government and available cash balance. This can less the requirement of the uh, government borrowing. Then is the taxation reform is very much important. If it goes well, then you, uh, our, our domestic product goes well. So there has a little been a, a appetite to fix the tax system generating just 10.3% of the GDP revenue for over the past uh, decade. So Pakistan domestic revenue mobilization strategy fails undermine economic growth and collect more than 70% of the revenue through the indirect taxation, which is not fair. Uh, toward the poor and the middle income and, and younger generation. So both the sale tax and the income tax base remain narrow and multiple uh, uh, consumption uh, uh, contributing the low revenue efficiency. It provides the nearly right. uh, 482 billion in the tax consumption and exemption in 2022, which is very bad in that way. Many of them affluent a segment of the policy. I would like to talk about, and please do ask the right, question right. about the PSDP fund and the state-owned enterprise. This is a major issue and uh, more than a bigger issue than the uh, uh, the black market. We can manage the black market uh, with the uh, good managerial economic uh, design, but uh, industrial uh, in the, uh, uh, those who run the industry must have to understand. They must have to come out of the cartel system. They are the they are the one. The, the, uh, I must have to point out the finger to them because they are the pioneer of the cartelization. Even in the poultry, even in the textile, even in the uh, other areas, even whatever you take it possible, FMCG is completely on their way. The, why they are into smuggling? Why are they uh, uh, right. into uh, tax reluctancy and other things? Why they are not generating the domestic product? Or why they are not increasing the uh, domestic uh, 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 production system. So uh, why they wanted to have uh, most of the most import system and uh, importing the uh, every chemical from the other country. So uh, most of the businessmen is acquiring all the imports from the uh, from other. They are not Tata Birlas. They are not thinking like uh, uh, Dirbhai Ambani. Why they why don't they think? for their Pakistan, for their country, why they are focusing on the report. Right. Imports. Responsibility must be taken. Thank you very much, Dr. Asnain Jawed, uh, economist and senior analyst for joining us in today's program. We will take a short break here. And when we come back, we will be talking more about economic challenges that Pakistan is facing and steps that are being taken and that are required uh, by the government uh, to revitalize our economy. Welcome back. We are talking about the current economic situation of the country and the steps 
that government is taking to deal and address these challenges. Uh, Dr. Khakan, uh, when we talk about uh, these economic challenges, of course, uh, inflation remains one of the key challenges that country is facing uh, right now. What are primary reasons uh, that uh, uh, you know uh, we have uh, we are witnessing this inflation uh, situation in the country, and what steps the government is taking uh, to address uh, inflation in the country and to stabilize the prices? So, Mariam, part of the inflation is coming from the um, outside. What, what does one mean by that? You know, when the commodity super cycle happened and things became more expensive abroad, um, the pass through of that price effect, whether it was edible oil, petroleum products, energy needs, um, wheat at times, cotton, uh, came from the outside, the pharmacy, the machinery, mm. everything. That uh, we were uh, discussing that, earlier as well, that the fluctuating uh, fl fluctuation in oil prices globally also impacts pricing in Pakistan because, of course, we are dependent on energy uh, from the outsource uh, south side and we import uh, energy. So that is one of the reasons for inflation. But let's talk about the steps that government is taking to stabilize uh, inflation and are these uh, steps yielding any results? What what needs to be done? It's, uh, you know, tragic. The biggest step that we can take right now um, to ease inflationary pressures is to improve the supply side of things. To improve the supply side of things, the economy has to generate more in terms of uh, whether it's, you know, the production in the agriculture sector, whether that's production in the uh, manufacturing sector, whether that's imports to fill in the supply needs. All these are dependent on the economy working growing, um, the entrepreneurs taking interest, and that all internally um, and externally is dependent on the supply of dollars. So I've always said, once you get an IMF program, things would actually ease. What the government has tried to do is, you know, for example, cheaper oil um, from Russia is one step. Um, um, the, the, the good um, uh, story is that we have a wheat production, which largely suffices the country's need. So that's a good story to tell. Um, the food and the pharmaceutical have um, been kept kind of in the essentials, so the imports have um, not been stopped there, so their supplies have been um, uh, consistent. Um, but still, on the other hand, the rising inflation is partly also because the administered prices, the energy prices, the petrol prices had to be increased because we had not done that for you know a couple of years now. Um, the electricity price, the gas price, as well as the petrol um, um, price, the diesel price. So they all had to be adjusted um, 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 accordingly with the international market. Um, then, of course, because we don't do direct taxation, we have a rupees 50 petroleum development levy on the petrol. Let's say Pakistan was great on um, um, uh, direct taxation. The petrol could go cheaper 50 rupees today, but that's not a story that that, that we can right. know. Right, but Dr. Khakan, are there some uh, long-term uh, structural reforms that are required when we talk about these inflationary factors uh, that needs to be implemented? So, Mariam, that's the key question that you've asked. And in the long run, the productive capacity of the economy can only solve the long run inflationary path of Pakistan's economy. By that, what I mean is that when you look at Pakistan's productive capacity in agriculture, um, it has gone very weak. Um, what do I mean by that? Pakistan produces, um, for example, let's look at our you know, key crops. Um, if you look at cotton, for example, um, Pakistan produces 566 kilograms per hectare. China produces 2,000 kilograms per hectare. So they produce four times, their yields are four times. Just imagine if the productivity of Pakistan even doubles from here, you can have cheaper agriculture, food and security will go away. Uh, wheat, three tons per hectare. The best countries in the world are doing 10 tons per hectare. The reason I give these two as an example is these, these are crops which we do and we probably are going to keep doing, but our agriculture productivity in them has gone weak. Um, the first area of reform to improve the Pakistan's dependence from abroad we, we import about $10 billion of agri and food products. So one thing, it will help with the balance of payments. It will create food uh, security. And third, what you ask, it will help bring down inflation. So I think something, if we want to structurally start repairing Pakistan, and number two, the energy sector. 
If you right, repair the important. energy right. sector, uh, that is your input into almost everything now. Of course, of course. So, um, Mr. Tosif, uh, when we talk about these uh, structural reforms, uh, what steps are needed by the government uh, to collaborate and coordinate with the relevant stakeholders, like uh, you earlier mentioned about the private sector, to sit with them and to address these uh, uh, challenges that uh, have caused inflation? Always we are willing to sit and we are willing to hmm. give the proposals as far as uh, we are able to cut down on red tapism, uh, promotion of industrialization that is one bit of it the other thing is we need to focus on the region uh, recently we had a delegation from Iran on Iran Pakistan gas pipeline and uh, we discussed them that are you working with somebody else they said we are working with China we have no problems we are exporting to India we have no problems we have working with Armenia no problems we are working with Iraq there's no problem we are working with Turkey there's no problem so uh, it means that there is, uh, uh, with the foreign policy, all these countries have managed to work with Iran. So mm. this is our time and for our uh, ministers at the Foreign Office and the Ministry of Foreign Office need to decide or whosoever needs to call the shot, let's call that shot that we need to work within the region and we need to work with Iran, not only for uh, mm. energy, for oil, for the uh, uh, domestic transaction and uh, so, far, uh, so far so uh, with the Central Asian Republics. Of uh, course. Of course, regional economic cooperation is also very important when we talk about addressing these economic challenges. Uh, so Hamza, how do you think that Pakistan can leverage the opportunities like CPAC uh, to address the, the economic situation that uh, Pakistan is facing at the moment? Well, the answer lies in CPAC's overall proposal when you talk about special mm -hmm. economic zones uh, that believes in do building domestic industrial capacity, ensuring that it has uh, you know, a trickle down effect on the local population and also has a positive impact on GDP growth rates. Uh, CPEC is to ensure regional connectivity. As I have you know, mentioned so many uh, times on different channels, when we talk about CPEC, it's a flagship program of the BRI. Of we're course. not talking about $46 billion mm -hmm. only, we're talking about 62. And when, why am I saying 62? Is because when we're talking about special economic zones, we're talking about infrastructural development, we're also talking about energy corridors as well. Mm. So CPEC ensures that this uh, entire project can you know, stimulate the Pakistan economy, mm. which has continued to be energy starved, which has continued to you know, be have. Of course, of course. In yeah. talking about projects like uh, CPAC, we know that uh, uh, small and medium uh, enterprises remain the backbone of yeah. any economy. Yeah. So, what do you think uh, should be done to, uh, you know, uh, to promote uh, the the investors to in come and invest in such initiatives? Uh, of course, we are expecting budget as well. So, what would you recommend the government should be including to promote the economic uh, cooperation when we talk about at regional level and regional initiatives? First of all, we need to reduce red tape. We need mm -hmm. to create investor friendly policies and for that to happen you need to offer incentives for investors to come in. Whenever they actually look to invest in a domestic on economy the first thing that they look forward to is in, uh, incentives. That could be basically mean tax cuts, that could also mean that you give them a level playing field so that they can you know uh, compete with different corporations for that matter. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, a combination of investor friendly policies and this uh, current government is pretty much working on that. Mm -hmm. They do understand that in order for Pakistan's economy to be resuscitated uh, FDI needs to increase mm -hmm. and FDI so can and only increase. Of yeah. course. What else is required to increase FDIs in Pakistan? Of course, we keep on talking about Pakistan is in need of foreign direct investments, mm -hmm. but what steps are needed and uh, is the government doing enough? I think the government is doing enough. At least there is this willpower to try and make sure that they can get rid of bureaucracy and red tapism of and course. stimulate FDIs. But I think that the most important thing is also to build up domestic industrial capacity. If you have the domestic industrial capacity and if you become an export oriented economy, which will obviously take time because the current account deficit is uh, still pretty wide. But if you look forward to the prospect of domestic industrial capacity, it increases GDP growth rates. It makes you more of a bargainer as far as trading ties is concerned as well. So that is where Pakistan also needs to work on. Another important factor is to ensure that we are looking at an environment where Pakistan looks to diversify it's uh, you, you could of say course. economic aid. Of course. We cannot solely rely on China and Saudi Arabia mm. alone. On a few sectors also, as on well. A, on a few sectors as well. Mm. So what that does is, uh, and another important part is that it's not necessarily Pakistan's fault that you had the 2022 floods which took place. That mm. absolutely destroyed your agricultural mm. sector. Mm. So in order for the and agricultural earlier sector, COVID was an an issue that earlier COVID-19 mm. was a problem as well. So Pakistan's realities, economic difficulties are also imported to a large extent. I mean, you had the climate crisis, the climate change crisis, which resulted in a debilitation as far as the uh, crop yield is concerned. And that has an impact on agricultural productivity. 
and you've got other countries which have been unscathed by that and their agricultural um, you know sectors are thriving so I think these are the areas which Pakistan need to uh, needs to work to, uh, forward to and also to build climate change resilience that would ensure that you know any untoward disaster which has a debilitating impact on the agricultural sector is also averted of course thank you very much uh, mr. Hamza Rafat You're for welcome. joining us in today's program thank you very much uh, mr. Tosif Zaman for joining us in today's program thank you very much uh, dr. Khakan Najib for joining us in today's program of course in today's program we discussed uh, a very significant topic uh, that is uh, the economic challenges that Pakistan Pakistan is uh, facing today. Of course, uh, there are a number of challenges and the reasons uh, behind those challenges, internal as well as external challenges, we discussed in detail in today's program. Of course, uh, moving forward, uh, we uh, require structural reforms uh, in our economic policies and government is also uh, taking steps uh, for these uh, policies, but we need a collective uh, 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 vision and as well as uh, informed decisions to move forward when we talk about uh, 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 addressing these challenges and uh, revitalizing the economy of Pakistan. That's all from Game Changer tonight. Take care. Allah Hafiz.